It's time for the The Douglas Douglas Coleman Coleman Show. Show. Mr. Smooth and Savvy is joined by guests from all walks of life. From From the the entertainment entertainment industry industry, to to authors to to political political and social social commentators, commentators, the famous and not so famous, the controversial and the light and fluffy, we have it all. Now, here's Douglas Douglas Coleman. Coleman. Well, hello there. Howdy, howdy, oh there. Welcome to the Douglas Coleman Show. It's me, Douglas Coleman. How are you? Thank you for joining us. Brandon Robertson is here today. Brandon is a minister at a church called Mission Gathering Christian Church in San Diego. He was nice enough to come on to discuss things about inclusion in the LGBT community and the concept that you can be gay and Christian. We get into a pretty good conversation. Stick around. He will be up in the second half of the show. Before we get to Brandon, we've got Mick Orton from The Silvers. And Mick is part of our complete promotional package personnel. He will be up to talk about his animated series, along with music, in The Origins of the Silvers. And we've got a song to play during the interview. It's called Here Comes the Rain Again. Before we get to the interview, we've got his promotional song that we've been featuring all month, called Who Do You Think You Are? Got to get the timing on that trumpet right. It just isn't working. Never comes in at the right moment. Lots to get to. So, here is the Silvers with Who Do You Think You Are? to Mr. Smooth and Savvy right here on the Douglas Coleman Show. We'll be right back after these commercial messages. 
The Douglas Coleman Show is now offering a complete radio promotional package for music artists. Your track will air 28 times a week for one month over all of our online and terrestrial platforms, as well as permanently archive on Spreaker, iTunes and many other sites. Your profile will also be featured in our Featured Music Artists page on our website. With this package, you will also get a 15-minute interview on our show to promote your latest single, EP, LP or upcoming gig. Similar packages like this can run hundreds of dollars and often are subscription-based. Our package is a one-time fee of just $49.99. Please go to douglascolemanmusic.com forward slash CRPP. That's douglascolemanmusic.com forward slash CRPP for complete details. Let's work together to get your music heard. DJC Music and DJC Productions are pleased to announce a brand new website. We have started a listing website for radio show hosts as well as potential show guests. This is a meeting site where hosts and guests can come together. Show hosts can list their show and types of guests they're interested in booking. Potential guests can list their talents, bio, accomplishments or anything they feel makes them an interesting radio show guest. There are no recurrent payments, only a one-time $5 listing fee. Your listing will stay up until you decide to cancel. Previous guests of The Douglas Coleman Show are welcome to submit their guest listing free of charge. Go to radiohostsandguests.com. That's radiohostsandguests.com. Okay, please welcome Mick Orton from The Silvers. Hi, Mick. How are you? Hey, I'm great out here on the West Coast. Oh, well, thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Also, thank you for signing up for our uh, complete radio promotional package. You were one of the original people to sign up for it. And wow. it's been doing really well. We just started this, actually, just uh, this month, February, and getting, okay. good, getting good response for it. So uh, I'm happy. I'm glad you're, you're on it, and we've been playing your song. It's a nice song. It reminded me of the, uh, well, it's very 60s. And it, yes. uh, the, the whole cartoon thing was very Beatles from the, the Beatles cartoon kind of. Why did you decide to do an animation along with your song? Did you just not want to perform <laughs> live? Well, we don't perform live because we're spread out all across the U.S. I've got two oh, guys okay. uh, are on opposite sides of Wisconsin. And then we've got Drew and, and me. We're here in California, and so it's kind of impossible to put the band together to, to play unless, you know, some kind of big venue. Um, and so we decided that, you know, rather than look in our ugly mugs, that we'd do some cute animation and, uh, and some with some little jokes and, uh, and things in there and see if people caught on and liked what we're doing. And so far we've gotten quite a great response on the songs and the animated videos. So the videos, I actually haven't watched one, I'm sorry, but um, <laughs> the videos are just the song, or is there, like, other things that go on? Well, when we started out, we started out just doing music videos with the complete song. And then we had this brainstorm to do, like you were talking about the Beatles uh, cartoon, it was kind of Beatles-inspired, where the band, you know, goes to this uh, alternate universe. They end up, they're taking a plane ride and they end up in a hurricane. The plane ends up shifting them to an alternate universe where, you know, animals and, and uh, fish talk and walk on land. Oh, and so, very cool. you know, okay. it was kind of, you know, just kind of a weird 60s experience. So we said, well, let's do that, but then we can't put the whole song in there. So now there's a lot of, uh, on the last two videos there's a lot of uh, dialogue that go along with a shortened song so that the animation the um, animators don't have to do a you know a 20 minute video they're doing a five minute video and so we shortened the song to about you know a minute and a half uh, about half of what the song really is but the early ones are all just all just music oh okay now are you writing the scripts for that as well 
and doing your own we voices. Did. Drew, yeah. Drew and I wrote the scripts for all of them. We actually started out working with the guys from The Hobbit, the uh, sound uh, guy from The Hobbit, John Mackay, yeah. who's in New Zealand, and um, he kind of inspired us to do the the uh, work first. So we did, uh, I think, 30 scripts, and so slowly, one by one, we're kind of putting them into action. 30 scripts. How many uh, cartoon videos do you have out at this point? Right now, we've got about seven or eight, and we've got a new one just coming online in about a week. Um, so they're slow. <laughs> Animation takes a long time to do, and the guys we're working with, one of them's in Germany, and one of them's, you know, you love the Internet, right? You know, the guy, one guy's in uh, Argentina, and one guy's in Germany, but he lives in, uh, I think it's North or South Carolina, and so, you know, thanks to the Internet, they can all work together. But even so, it takes a long time to, to put the animation together. And so we write the scripts, we give it to him. He does his work, they do their work, I'm sorry. And then uh, his name is Randall, R-E-N-D-Y-L Bishop. You can find him online. He also does a, a uh, comic book series uh, called The Hawk of New York, which has been very popular. And, uh, you know, so we're just kind of slowly slogging through it and hoping, you know, put up good stuff. Now, is this going to be a, a weekly, monthly, uh, like a regular thing, a regular cartoon? I wish we could do on? it. I wish we could do it weekly, but it just, you know, it's, it's, it's ending work, up yeah. being kind of uh, spread out. Uh, uh, we were hoping to shoot for a once a month, but it's just not happening quickly enough. Well, even then, you've got to write at least one song every month, right? Oh, we're writing lots of songs. We've got a new album, a 14-song album that's coming out in March, and we have a, at the end of summer, we do a uh, six- to eight-song EP. So every year we do doing 14 songs, and then uh, uh, plus the eight, six to eight. So, yeah, we're doing a lot of music all the time. Oh, well, okay, that would cover the, the cartoons then. You could do one a month and... <laughs> And, Absolutely. Right? Yeah. And still We'd have, like, like, like them to work faster. I don't know if we can give them something to speed them up, but you know, more caffeine or whatever. But uh, uh, yeah, the the we announce all our releases on our website, thesilversmusic.com, dot com, and uh, and also any releases, any news that we have about the band. Uh, you said the animators. Is this? It can't be the same way it was done years and years ago. This isn't. It's computer animated, right? Not hand-drawn frame by frame like they used to do. Right I time. wish I knew. <laughs> I'm not an animator, so I really don't know what they do. They send me a storyboard early on, which I think are hand-drawn, but past that I don't know if they do it on the computer or whether they're doing images on, you know, and then importing them. I really couldn't tell you. In fact, the guy to interview would be Randall Bishop. He'd be the one to talk to about that. Yeah. We just do the music. I've never, uh, I've never talked to anybody who was an animator, and oh, I well, know, I can give you his contact information. He's yeah. a great guy. I know. In the old days, they used to actually have like a whole room full of people, you know, back in the Warner sure. Brothers cartoon, Bugs Bunnies and stuff, and they were frame by frame that they would draw. Right. And I thought, oh my <laughs> god, how tedious! Really? And exactly. Now I suspect so, you can computerize it. And you know, yeah, do I think one more of it's done on computer than yeah. in the past. So tell me a little bit about the Silvers. Tell us a little about your uh, the background of the Silvers and how you guys got together. And well, back in the '70s, there was a band called Silver Laughter that I was in. We were inducted into the Iowa Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2014, hmm. and the band got together and did a reunion concert. And after the concert, I had suggested that maybe we do another album and everybody kind of looked at me like ah, sorry we're not interested so fortunately in the studio in the audience a old friend of mine that was in another band way back in high school um was there tom and uh, we talked about doing stuff long distance he's one of the guys that lives in wisconsin and so we decided to put together an album of songs that i had written with one of the other guys in the silver laughter and then from there, it just kind of steamrolled into just writing new stuff all the time. So now we've had, uh, what, three albums, three 14-song albums with another one coming out next month. And then, um, you know, three, uh, I'm sorry, four uh, six-song EPs. So 
you know, just kind of it's kind of steamrolled, and I'm having fun, and just keep on doing it. Well, that's great. We got one of your tracks to play. It's called "Here Comes the Rain Again," and uh, is there any story behind this one? Well, um, the story was that. Uh, the the guy is thinking about you know it's awfully raining all the time why does it keep raining every time i'm thinking about you this woman so the idea is that you know he's thinking about his lost love and every time he thinks about it, it's raining well it's not raining it's tears it's if you look at the uh the website or i'm sorry the uh the animated video that goes along with this there's some talking but it's mick the singer with a little rain cloud over his head in this alternate universe and uh, you might have fun watching that. Yeah, okay. Well, let's listen to the song. This is Here Comes the Rain Again by The Silvers. It's been raining for so long now But I see the skies are blue Started by the track i like that <laughs> thank you yeah the the whole concept of the silver surf city animated videos is kind of an anti-bullying uh music solves the problems uh type of message that we want to get out to people well i think music has been something of a calming effect for many many people although music can go either way yeah some music oh, can yeah. get people riled up and starting starting to break things and tear things down but uh it uh i guess it depends the 60s was real good for that they had a lot well, of well that's kind of, of what we like getting music. back to because yeah. you know the beatles inspired us and you know back then everybody was in a band right even the guy that worked at the grocery store and uh you know out of that as time went on the cream rises to the top the guys that started to were really good started to make money at it and stayed in it and so you know we'd like to bring that back see kids starting to make uh, bands again you know that'd be great yeah um i i think it is coming back slowly uh i know i'm real excited about the band uh, greta van fleet and uh -huh. they they're fantastic and i know people said that they 
copied Led Zeppelin, but even Robert Plant likes him. So if Plant likes him, I'm happy. I like him. <laughs> you know, really? <laughs> you know, they're young. They're 18, 19, but they're doing that kind of music. I mean, not every song sounds like Led Zeppelin. Some sound like Rush. A couple of songs they have sound like ACDC. But it's just good rock and roll music, and I'm very happy to hear that they're doing well. I think they won a Grammy, actually. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah, our uh, our latest uh, uh, EP release got great review in uh, Shindig Magazine last month. Um, so they really liked it. They thought it was just, uh, you know, great. Oh, super. So your website is thesilversmusic.com, yeah? The Silvers Music. Dot com. Okay. And you said your EP is out or is coming out? We have an EP called uh, Summertime Sounds that came out, but we've got a new album out coming out uh, in a couple of weeks called Rushmore. It's kind of a uh, retrospect. There's some songs on there that kind of harken back to what we were talking about with people being in bands and everything. So I think it'll be well received. Oh, super. Well, Mick, yeah, we're a- looking for... Oh, I'm sorry. We're looking for a review in Shindig Magazine in April, so and there'll be a big uh, advertisement for it. So, Okay. Thank you oh. so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Thank you for signing up for our promo package, and best of luck with everything that you're doing. Thank you. Glad to be with you. You're listening to Mr. Smooth and Savvy right here on The Douglas Coleman Show. We'll be right back after these commercial messages. Are you an independent musician? How would you like to have your songs played on hundreds of radio stations just like the one you're listening to right now? Join MusicSubmit.com and we'll promote your music to radio stations and blogs in your genre. It's free to set up your account and we guarantee your music will be considered for airplay by radio stations worldwide. Why not sign up today? It's free. MusicSubmit.com Radio promotion for indie musicians. And now... Hey, Rocky! Watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat! See? <laughs> Nothing up my sleeve. Presto! <laughs> Wrong hat! Now here's something we hope you'll really like. Okay, please welcome my guest, Brandon Robertson. Hi, Brandon. How are you? I'm doing so well. Thanks for having me, Tony. Well, thank you for coming on the show. I uh, appreciate it. As we were just talking about before we cut on here, we found you kind of through Jesse Peterson's show, and I wanted to have you on because you seem like a very intelligent guy. Give us your quick background before we start. There was one thing I did want to ask, and then you can do the background. You received your Bachelor of Arts in Pastoral Ministry. Is that, did I pronounce that right? What is that? What exactly is a BA in Pastoral Ministry? What do they teach you? Yeah, so um, I got my degree in pastoral theology from Moody Bible Institute, and um, basically it's a four-year undergraduate school that's teaching you how to be an effective minister in much of the evangelical world. uh, They only require a bachelor's degree, whereas so many other parts of the church would require uh, a master's of divinity or something equivalent to that. So it was basically an undergraduate MDiv degree. We learned... um, things like pastoral counseling, some basic psychology, um, and then also my degree in particular was um, a large majority of theology and ethics because that was my particular interest. So spending lots of time reading old theologians and then uh, probably another half of that time learning how to preach and communicate well and do uh, counseling with people. So it's like Bible study mixed with acting and drama? Yes, that's one way to put it, for sure. Okay. Well, because, then, you know, depending on what church you go to, there is an awful lot of drama. And yeah. I didn't really go to church. My family was not very religious, except for my grandfather. Uh, but he never took people. You know, he didn't uh, make us go when we were little kids. And I think he went to one of those really, I don't even know what it was called, But it was one of those really plain, boring kind of, you know, it wasn't like Catholic Church at all with all the theatrics and, um, you know, this was like a plain wooden box with a crucifix and uh, very hard, uncomfortable seats. And um, (laughs) 
a church while you wonder why anybody would go there. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, all I can think of is the Puritans who came, you know, and set up these little churches in Massachusetts and they wanted to get away from all of the sort of histrionics of of the Anglican church. And plain and simple, like, uh, who are those people? Not the Quakers. Yeah. Well, the Quakers were one, but... The Quakers are one. There's a couple denominations. There's one called the Church of Christ, which is another one that's super plain. They actually don't use instruments. There's the Puritans. Um, there's the Congregationalists up north, northeast. Um, lots of different uh, boring European Christianity that came over to America when our country was just being founded. Yeah. I know. I'm trying to think of the ones that are in Pennsylvania. Uh, yeah. Oh, the Amish. The Amish. That's the, <laughs> I couldn't think of that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, something like that, where, you know, electricity is frowned upon and motor vehicles are frowned upon, all that kind of stuff. Okay, so you did that. And then how did you get to setting up your church? I mean, is this what you wanted to do? Is this what you, as a kid, you said, I'm going to be a minister? Or did something happen in your life that you found God, as it were, and then decided that this was your calling? Yeah, it's really both of those things. When I was uh, 12 years old, I'd grown up in a, a trailer park outside of Washington, D.C., so it was this very interesting um, upbringing, being kind of on the poverty line, but also surrounded by wealthy, influential people. And um, I had an abusive alcoholic father, and so when I was 12, I started attending church with my neighbors, and I was just really broken. And as a young kid, I was um, just mentally uh, broken down from the abuse from my father, and I started going to this church and hearing about a God who could be a better father to me than my father could ever be. Um, and I had a conversion experience. And within about four months of official, officially converting to become a Christian, um, when I was 12, I felt this distinct call from God to be a pastor, meaning to give my life to communicate the same hope full truth that I had received that had really uh, given me hope in the midst of depression and anxiety and feeling suicidal. And so from 12 years old onward, I have uh, been pursuing the goal of becoming a pastor. And as we talked about, I went to college for that. I went to seminary for that. I'm about to start my PhD, still studying theology and all of that good stuff. So given my whole life in this direction thus far. What is a calling from God look like or feel like yeah for me it's nothing uh it's nothing super dramatic it was just no big firework show or anything no lights going mm -hmm. off and on no it was a cheesy little story i was literally uh, <laughs> i remember a date and time when it actually happened i was basically got home from church um again my family was poor so i went to the thrift store and bought a uh, oversized uh, suit and tie so i'm standing in my backyard in this oversized suit with my little free Gideon's Bible, and I just start preaching to no one. <laughs> and as I was preaching from the Bible, I just had this distinct, I don't know, you could call it a warmth or a prompting or whatever, but it was just this distinct idea that to be able to preach and communicate to people that their lives had meaning and that um, no matter what circumstances they were in, they could overcome them and that there's a God who has a plan and purpose for them. That just felt like something worth giving my life to. And so I did. And it's it's kind of crazy to look back now. I'm almost 27 and looking back and seeing that something that happened when I was 12 has really shaped every aspect of my life up until now. But I still feel that strong sense of calling to keep communicating truth and love and hope to people, especially in this day and age. So God is love. Absolutely. Okay. But you can have love without God, or can you? You know, my theology, I would say uh, no, but it doesn't mean what you might think it means. I think I would call love God. Love and God are synonymous. So wherever love is, I think God is there. I don't think anybody has to call it God. I don't think you have to call it Jesus or anything like that. But my understanding of God is love and is the ground of being. So I think we're all participating in God, whether we uh, believe in God or not, or call it God. Do you think the concepts of religion and higher power have been completely misinterpreted by man? Oh, I definitely think um, any time, as somebody who spent way too much time and money <laughs> getting degrees in theology, uh, the one thing that I've come away from all of it learning is that 
the people who are most certain about who God is or what God looks like are the people we can be certain are wrong about God. Um, we're talking about the infinite, uh, expansive, eternal creator, and we are finite. And so it requires humility. And where there's no humility to say we're probably wrong about whatever we're talking about, uh, I, I have a really hard time trusting those people. So what do you think of the Pope? Well, that's a twofold question. Um, the papacy in general is an interesting concept. I'm not so sure uh, Jesus would have been super stoked to see um, the movement that he started turn into this crazy, huge, multi-billion, trillion dollar industry called the church, whether it's Catholic or any other church. Um, but the current Pope, Pope Francis, while he's still got some of uh, the rough theological edges, he's still not LGBT inclusive in the way that I, I would love to see him be. Um, I do think he is moving the Catholic Church gradually, um, inch by inch, towards what I hope is a more just and generous version of Christianity. And so I'm a fan of Francis, but it's a it's a guarded fan uh, fandom towards him because uh, I think he gets a lot of credit for being more inclusive than he actually is, but I do think he's a good step forward for the Catholic Church. So, okay, so the Pope as an individual you think is all right, but the institution or the corporation of the Vatican maybe leaves something to be desired? Yeah, and I mean, I just read this book that's kind of been making news all this past week. It's called In the Closet of the Vatican. Um, and just reading the kind of corruption of the institution. And again, I don't think it's a Catholic thing. This is not anti-Catholic. I think any religious institution that amasses power, privilege, and wealth is going to be corrupt. And so I'm skeptical of all of it, even the ones I participate in. Well, I mean, it seems like from what we hear on the news that the uh, the Vatican has been, you know, a thousand year old pedophile sex ring masquerading mm -hmm. as pious, you know, because there seems to be so much of that in the news. Now, whether it's sensationalized or not, I don't know. But it does make me wonder when they only allow celibate single men to be priests, you yeah. know, if they opened it up and let married men be priests, let women be priests, wouldn't the number of potential pedophiles diminish somewhat? I mean, just statistically? Yeah, I think there's some legitimate critique there. I mean, my last degree was focused specifically on Christianity, sexual ethics from the first century. So right when Christianity was starting. And the Catholic Church's sexual teachings and requirements for priests and for everyone are really rooted in some um, not super biblical, not super, uh, I would say, healthy versions and understandings of what sexuality is. And so I'm with you. I think um, the denominations of Christianity that open themselves up to uh, modern understandings of sexuality and gender are ones that tend to have healthier uh, communities. But when you have communities that force priests to repress their God-created sexuality, um, I think that repression causes those desires to pop up in unhealthy ways. And that's just plain psychology. Because, you know, they're taking advantage of the most vulnerable people on the planet, which are the children, and sure. using that sort of holier than thou power in taking advantage of it. And, you know, I think it's it's terrible. It's awful what, it what has happened. Well, all right, let's move on to something a little more joyous. Um, <laughs> now, you are gay, I assume, right? Yes. Okay. I don't want to make any assumptions, you know, but uh, I just made Totally. That. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And I had a guy on, a, I don't know, a couple months ago. His name was Tim Rimel. I don't know if you know yeah. who he is. Totally. You know him? I do. Not okay. well, but... Well, he was uh, an evangelical Christian minister for 25 years, and uh, he also was a survivor of the gay conversion therapy. And did you also go to gay conversion therapy? I did. Probably not in the same version um, that he did. Mine was a, a mild version at my college, but um, yeah, I did go through a year of conversion or reparative therapy. Yeah. So, I mean, I have these horrible mental image pictures of people being strapped to chairs and electrodes placed on your genitals and shocking you into going straight. I mean, what is actually going on in these conversion therapies? 
Yeah, well, I'll start with my most traumatic uh, experience, and I'll pull it back a little bit. But the closest thing to the strapping in chairs and electrodes for me was um, one particular instance um, after I was clearly not getting better. I was sent from the woman who was doing my therapy to kind of the, the base of this version of conversion therapy, which is in Wheaton, Illinois. So I went out to this church and basically what they made me do was sit in front of three pastors and confess all of my sexual sins and all the lustful thoughts I thought about. And then um, they prayed over each part of my body uh, with holy water, including oh uh, genital areas, not naked, but still pouring holy water on them. And then they stood up and got around me and started speaking in tongues, which is basically um, gibberish. Um, and they were yelling uh, for about 10 minutes. And so I'm standing there wet and getting yelled at. And supposedly this is supposed to heal me. And I walked out of that that particular instance, realizing that this whole thing was, one, incompatible with my understanding of God and Jesus, but also never going to help me heal of my sexuality. And just generally, my version of conversion therapy was called healing prayer. And once a week, I would go in, I'd confess my sins, um, I'd be prayed over, and and then we'd go back into my past and try to find areas that, um, areas of trauma from my early life, because the whole foundation of conversion therapy is because of abusive fathers and overattached mothers, um, people's sexuality and gender identity gets messed up. And so if you can heal from the wounds of your abusive fathers and overattached mothers, then your sexuality will be healed. So I spent a year reliving traumatic memories from my childhood and praying that God would heal me from the damage done by them. And at the end of the year, I felt a lot more healthy and whole because I spent a year talking about my trauma. But the one thing that didn't change was my sexuality still felt stronger than ever, even though I felt like a more whole person because I spent that time doing that kind of therapy. So, well, yeah. I, I think they're still under the impression that gay is a choice. Absolutely. It's either a choice. Some of the uh, Christians in the world today really have moved to say, even if it's not a choice, it's definitely nurtured by environments. And yeah, it's completely incompatible with everything modern psychology says about sexuality and gender identity. But it, it never made sense to me because I have known people who had the same mother, the same father, and one of the kids came out completely gay and the other one completely straight. Totally. You know, exact same parents. They didn't treat them any different. And, yeah, you know, there's no basis for that. The interesting thing, though, is I did see a, a study or like a survey, a poll, whatever you want to call it, that yeah. they did of gay men in the United States. And out of every 10, seven of them had the classic either absent or passive beta father and an overbearing mother. Sure. So seven out of 10 and, had that set up that, you know, psychologists used to say was the reason that people became gay. But it wasn't conclusive because some of those out of the seven also had straight brothers or straight sisters. I think with that, like my ex- my experience is this. Um, sexuality is so complex that there are components of nature and nurture within it. But to assume that by certain psychological procedures or processes or spiritual procedures and processes that you can um, intentionally change your sexuality, I think, is is just not something that has ever been proven to be helpful. But I do think that sexuality does have components of nature and nurture. I think there are there's lots of studies that talk about the genetic makeup of LGBT people versus heterosexuals. And there are some unique common patterns there, but because sexuality is fluid um, and I think it does morph and change and evolve, um, I do think that there are some components of the nurture argument and I I think it would be unhelpful to uh, deny that, yeah, perhaps part of uh, the way somebody grew up helped shape their sexual identity, but it's certainly not the whole of it and that also doesn't mean that it should be attempted to be changed. Well, human sexuality is unique from the rest of the animal kingdom. There are so many components to it where 
we can be sexually aroused by pornography. Okay, I don't know that dogs watch dog porno, you know, <laughs> and I, I don't think that happens. You know, I think on their level, sexuality is directly related to procreation, where sure. ours at least has evolved where it's not. I mean, you can go back a thousand years and there were erotic drawings. People were doing yeah. that already. So there's so much more to human sexuality that it's impossible to, for me, it's impossible to accept the argument that, oh, it's just a biological function for procreation. Yeah. Not anymore. Maybe, you know, 100,000 years ago, but not now. Not when there's, you know, porn on all the time and they're making yeah. millions of dollars. Um, totally. <laughs> you know. And I think, I think that's such a good point. And I think the Catholic Church, not to go back to them, and I, I don't mean to be sounding anti-Catholic because I'm not, but they're one of the only Christian bodies that still um, dogmatically advocates that sex is only and primarily for procreation, which is a view that so many Christians, and I would say religious uh, traditions around the world, have evolved from, exactly as you're saying, to say, no, sex actually is for emotional int intimacy, it's for pleasure, it's for all of these other um, benefit beyond just creating new life. And yeah, it's an interesting moment that um, we see some religious traditions still trying to hold on to that, despite what experiential evidence uh, suggests. Well, that's a good segue, because I wanted to bring up this point that was, uh, I don't know if this was on your bio or if it was something that I just made up, but... <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Either way. Okay, your church is called Mission Gathering Christian Church. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, so I did get that one. Okay, redefining what it means to be a Christian might not be an easy pill for some people to swallow. One of the things that I had kind of an epiphany about was back in 2013 when the gay marriage issue, the legality of it, was a hot topic. You know, it was coming and people were protesting it and people were supporting it. And there was all kinds. It was front page on the news, everything. And I saw an article in the San Francisco Examiner where they did a poll and they polled primarily black and Hispanic people. Do you support gay marriage? And 75% of them said no, they did not. And there was an editorial, an op-ed connected with this article from a gay rights activist in San Francisco who was appalled that, you know, how dare these people not support us when we supported them during the civil rights and during, you know, all of this stuff. And I realized at that point that identity politics doesn't work because you cannot assume that people just because they're gay are liberal. And you cannot assume that just because people are Christian are conservative. Once you establish that in your mind, then the whole concept of identity politics goes right out the window, to my opinion. So I yeah. wanted to know how you felt about that, because uh, I think it's a good topic of conversation, especially in this divisive, political, polarized climate that we live in at the moment. Yeah. I think I agree with you probably up to 75 percent, uh, I would say. I think right now we're seeing the pendulum um, go all the way to one side on the identity politics uh, issue. And I think we're seeing how destructive it becomes and how unhelpful it becomes when we make everything about um, various aspects of identity. And on the other side, I do think... Uh, we should be careful not to swing all the way back to the other side and say that identity isn't important. I think uh, there are, when we're talking about justice and we're talking about uh, equity, I think it's important to talk about the various aspects of um, people's identities that cause them to be uh, marginalized or oppressed. But I'm with you as I sit and watch, uh, even in my own world, because I do, I'll admit, live in a pretty liberal bubble here in San Diego and, um, uh, it's really disheartening to watch how liberals uh, beat each other up and tear each other to pieces over identity politics and over this this whole, exactly what you're describing, like uh, 
the unwillingness to support one another or pitting each other against one another based on various aspects of identity. I just don't think it's helpful to liberal causes, and I don't think it's helpful to um, our progress as a country, as a people. And again, I think, as you've already stated, this political and cultural moment that we're in in America is showing what happens when we lean completely on identity politics on both the right and the left. It causes the most binary, divisive moment that we've seen perhaps in all of American history. And it's it's uh, really unfortunate. Well, I think the only time in American history where it was worse was at the beginning of the Civil War. And that was just a split right down the Mason-Dixon line. And it probably won't get to that now because I don't think you could mobilize people to one side or the other. And I would argue that on the left, they would have more trouble. I think on the yeah. right, you could get all the guys with the guns and the Trump hats, and they would be all cool in one group. But yeah. on the left, no. <laughs> I don't yeah. think you could get a consensus amongst the left to uh, to mobilize into one group with one ideology. Yeah, totally. And I, I think that's a Again, there's a great benefit to the left's emphasis on diversity and different perspectives and all of that good stuff. And there's a reason that we're having, I mean, even just speaking politically, um, such a hard time gaining traction and um, making an impact is because the left can't unify on what we stand for. Um, and yeah, unless that changes, I think we're in for a rough road ahead. Okay, so you seem to have kind of bridged one particular gap where it's okay to be gay and it's okay to be Christian. When you first started your church, was it the idea that it was going to be advertised as a gay-friendly church or a gay church? I mean, how did you set it up to yeah. recruit, not recruit, but encourage <laughs> encourage your followers to come? Totally. So I didn't actually start this church. It's been around for 11 years. It was started by a friend of mine who is an evangelical who came out as gay after being in ministry. And so that did kind of create the culture of our church from the beginning because you had this evangelical guy starting it. And then while as the pastor, he came out, that changes the DNA. And I actually think that was really helpful to our trajectory as a church because it was initially primarily uh, straight people who now realized they had a gay pastor and most of them stuck around and then we started, of course, attracting the LGBT community. And so uh, since I've been the pastor, since I'm pretty publicly outspoken about being both gay, progressive, and Christian, uh, the demographic of people that attend our church um, is increasingly um, LGBT or LGBT-friendly and progressive. But I think that's just the way um, institutions function. Whoever is uh, in the leadership position tends to attract people that look like them, believe like them, act like them. So, uh, But I would say our church, we still fight very hard to make sure that we don't become a gay church, um, because I believe when we come together on Sunday mornings, it's the one space that we suspend identity, um, and we say we are here together as one human family before our Creator. Um, so I really, we fight against the idea that we're just a gay church, uh, and we try to be a church that welcomes and includes all of those who have been marginalized uh, in particular. Okay. What would I see if I came to your church? Now, do you do this on Sunday, I assume? Yes. Sunday okay, so morning. what would I see if I came in on a Sunday for a, a service? See, it's so long since I've been yeah. to church, I was going to say a performance. <laughs> uh, what would I see at a your service? A little bit service? of both. <laughs> yeah, it's... Uh, what you would see when you walked in, and I'll describe, I mean, the first time I walked into Mission Gathering is what made me want to be their pastor. Um, one, it's a really relaxed environment. We've got uh, secular music, so to speak, playing over the loudspeaker, people drinking coffee, talking. Um, these are just very normal people, not a lot of suits and ties, just people in shorts and flip-flops. This is Southern California. So, um, And then when the service starts, if you were to look around, you'd see truly... Um, the most diverse group of people that you'll probably be around any other time in your week. Um, we've got probably 15% of our congregation would be in poverty or on homeless. 
Um, so we have that large demographic, but then we also have uh, people that work in the medical industry and lawyers that are on the wealthy side of things. You'll see gay parents with their daughter, uh, two fathers and their daughter, and you'll see straight couples that are uh, popping out babies left and right. And uh, so it's a beautiful, diverse um, crowd. And then the service is contemporary evangelical music. Um, and I get up and preach for about 30 to 40 minutes on the Bible, but from a hopefully practical and progressive perspective. We do communion together, and we really emphasize that everyone is welcome, no matter who you are or what you believe. Um, and then we head out, and most of our church goes out for Sunday fun day and gets their mimosas and has a nice rest of their day. So it's a, it's a really relaxed environment, and our hope is that it's just a place for people to heal from toxic religion, um, because so many of us grew up in these environments that were the exact opposite of what Mission Gathering is. And um, it's a place where there are a lot of hurting people, but also a lot of people finding healing and reconnection with God. Oh, that's great. Toxic religion, that's an interesting term. Do you get a lot of criticism for what you're doing? Absolutely. Uh, probably uh, every day I'll get at least a message, a comment, an email, a phone call uh, from people around the country or around the world. And since I since I stepped out um, five years ago now um, as an openly LGBT uh, Christian, the religious movement that I was a part of, I was kind of up and coming in the evangelical world and they just crucified me very publicly. Um, and so now there are, it always surprises me how many non-affirming conservative Christians are so interested in my life and what I do because there are articles and podcasts and crazy stuff that keeps popping up uh, all the time of people just calling me the Antichrist or the reason that the church is being destroyed or whatever. Um, and and to me, it's just laughable. I'm a 26-year-old gay pastor trying to figure this out myself, and people see me as some force of destruction in global Christianity or something like that, and that's crazy. <laughs> well, I mean, religion has been, or the institution of religion has been evolving since day one. You know, it started with the Jews, right? And then the Christians, sure. when Jesus was born, the Muslims came shortly thereafter. And then the King James rewrote the Bible into Middle English and told the Pope, basically, that we're not speaking Latin in England anymore. And then yeah. 1600, they got on the boat and came to America and started a whole new version of it. So it just keeps evolving as society grows. I don't believe that societies can be created. Society has to grow on its own because we're human beings. We're living things. We're not machines. We can't be programmed. And maybe this is just the next step. Maybe it's, you know, okay, so now it's okay to be gay and Christian. I think we've got much bigger problems in this world than worrying about who sleeps with who and who believes in what. Totally. I think you're absolutely right. And um, one of my mentors is a, a renowned philosopher named Ken Wilber, who has been writing about this for decades, that the next leap in uh, the religious, spiritual evolution of humanity is towards a more globalized uh, version of faith that doesn't focus so much on doctrines and dogmas, but focuses on standing in awe and humility of the thing that we call God or that you call the universe or whatever you call it, and trying our best to get humanity out of the mess that we're creating, uh, because our mess is getting pretty bad. Yeah, speaking of religion, I spend a good deal of time in Thailand, and Buddhism, in the Thai Buddhism, their version of it, they consider transgenders to be like a third gender. They already have it, totally. and they've had it for, you know, thousands of years. They said, okay, there's men, there's women, and then there's the men that are in between. And it could be gay men, or it could be actually transgender men. And they just consider it a third gender. So it's like yeah. they've already included that. If you go to, into Thailand, I don't know if you've ever been to Thailand, but you can go into shops and you just see people that are transgender, that are just have been, you know, integrated into society like nothing. And there's totally. no there's no issue with it. I think that's a great uh, point. We have this, 
we have this understanding that humanity is constantly progressing, and I believe that at some sense, but there's a lot of wisdom of all of these ancient traditions. I mean, even even in the Jewish and Christian traditions, there uh, Jesus speaks really highly of eunuchs who are uh, men who are either seen as too feminine to fit the patriarchal construct of their culture or men who have been castrated. And there are unique positions of honor for them. And the Native American traditions have uh, people who, of the third spirit um, that are very similar. Like, we've come from an inclusive past in some, to some degree. And I think hearkening back to the wisdom of some of our earlier traditions is actually what's needed in this moment um, to help our religious and spiritual traditions to move forward. I hate to think that we as a people are regressing while technology yeah. is just soaring in the other direction. Maybe there's a totally. comparison between the two. Maybe the faster technology leaps and bounds, the more we go backwards as a culture, intellectually and spiritually. That might be a good, yeah. uh, a good subject for somebody's uh, dissertation. <laughs> totally. And I, I, think, I think there's something there, right? As technology gets more uh, all-consuming for us, um, it's one of our, my biggest struggles, right, is how much time every day I spend on a screen and how that feels dehumanizing. Like maybe it is time for us to go a little bit backwards. So interesting point there. And when I grew up, there was no internet. There was no computers that did anything other than word processing. And now my life is, like you said, sitting in front of a screen. But I don't really see how it's this magic that I thought it was going to be. When they first came out, I thought, oh, this is going to unite the world. This is going to bridge us all together because people that don't even speak English speak Windows. Everybody knows how to operate the computer system. And through that, it could be an international language, like sign language is international, which I thought was really interesting. If you're an English-speaking person and can sign, you can sign with anyone in the world. It's all the same. Sure. So I thought that the internet and Windows and the technology was going to do that. And to some degree it has, but it, it's very disappointing if this is the result. Totally. And I think that is the question that we're all grappling with now, right? Is um, It is technology that's created both this interconnectedness that's amazing, but also this deep sense of polarization and division because we get to choose who we listen to um, and we spend most of our days scrolling through a Facebook feed of people that all share the same opinion. So it's actually not connecting us in that global way that we hoped it would. Um, it's very interesting. It's kind of pigeonholing people. Yeah. And that's too bad because people tune in to look at their news from the news outlet that shares their view. And that's not, that's not how it used to be. That's never how it was. The news outlets reported the news and then you got to decide <laughs> how you felt about it. Now they're giving you your opinion for you. And I, I don't like it at all. I've, I've yet to find one news agency that I used to like BBC, but then now they've gone way too liberal too. And sure, you know, I don't know. I look at all of them now. I look at like the, the, the most liberal ones, the most conservative ones and draw a line right down the middle. And I think that's a pretty accurate picture of what they're trying to paint, I hope. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Brandon, we got to wrap this up. Unfortunately, we have kind of gone over our time already. Do you have a book right now that you're promoting? Um, I have a book that just came out six months ago called True Inclusion, and I have a book coming out in two months called The Gospel of Inclusion, both uh, arguing for um, a more expansive and inclusive understanding of what it means to be a Christian. So. Super. Do you have a website? You want to plug? BrandonRobertson.com, and that's Brandon with an A, uh, and everything's there. So if they find their way to the website, you'll find all the information about everything. So. Thank you so much for coming on the show. This was uh, very enlightening to talk to you. Likewise. And, um, Thank you for, thanks for making space for the conversation. I, I enjoy it. Well, best of luck with everything you're doing. And if I get to San Diego, maybe I'll drop in on your church sometime. That'd be awesome. Let me know if you're coming, and uh, we'll make you feel right at home. Well, that's about all the time we've got for the show today. I want to thank my special guest, Brandon Robertson and Mick Orton of the Silvers. Thank you, guys. This is Douglas Coleman saying I'll see you.